May the wonderful grace of Jesus and the amazing love of God our Father and the powerful peace of his Holy Spirit be with you this morning. Uh, 
Uh, I am so glad for this morning the Lord has given to us, a beautiful morning to gather and to sing his praises, to offer our prayers, to remind ourselves that we belong to him, to give thanks for his many blessings. And uh, we gather together uh, in the Lord's name. I welcome those who are visiting with us this morning, uh, those who are Zooming in, glad to have you here. And we pray that the Lord would come and bless us and touch each one of us with his merciful grace this morning. A few announcements as we begin our worship service. Uh, and Sean, if you'll come on over, you've got a couple of announcements in, in a second. Uh, if you'll note announcements that are printed in the calendar items, one, uh, announcement number five about the men's uh, monthly uh, luncheon is tomorrow, and there's some details there about that, and Sean has a couple of announcements too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good morning. A uh, couple of things. Uh, I wanted to make you aware of uh, uh, Christian Neighbors Church next Saturday is uh, sponsoring a Waukegan cleanup at 8.30 in the morning. <coughs> They're going to divide everybody up in teams and send them around to, to pick up litter and do things like that. If you've ever thought that you'd like to get to know some of them better, to, this next Saturday would be a perfect opportunity to do so. That'll be at 8.30 at the morning at the Christian Neighbors Church, which is right down the street. Uh, the second announcement is that we have, uh, we started uh, a ways back uh, a study on how, how to read the Bible for all it's worth, and then kind of got sidetracked with Christianity Explored, and we decided to start it back up again and open it up to anybody, not just men, and so, if you would say this morning that I'd like to be able to understand the Bible a little better than what I do now, this might be a, something that would be of help to you. Please join us at about 11.15 up in the chapel, and we'll uh, talk about what we're going to do. I have plenty of books, so uh, don't worry about that. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, we come into your presence this morning. Uh, we, we come with hopes and fears. We come bearing burdens as well as uh, be grateful for joys. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, whatever our need, that you would meet us in this hour of worship. And uh, whatever praise that we have to offer, that you would be glorified in it. So set us apart now to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. morning. Please join me in the affirmation of faith, which today is taken from the Essentials of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. You'll find it printed in your bulletin. Let every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. We believe in one God, the sovereign creator and sustainer of all things, infinitely perfect and eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To him be all honor, glory, and praise forever. You may be seated. Today's Bible reading is from the book of Ruth, chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. It begins on page 285 in the Pew Bible. For a little background, the story of Ruth takes place in the time of the judges before Israel had a king. An older Israelite woman, Naomi, and her Moabite daughter-in-law, Ruth, are poor widows living in Bethlehem. In ancient Israel, preserving the integrity of the family clan was very important. When a man died, his closest male relative was obligated to buy the rights to the man's land to keep it in the family. This kinsman redeemer, as he was called, was also obligated to marry the man's widow and to raise up offspring for the deceased man so that his name would not be lost from Israel. In our passage today, a wealthy landowner named Boaz has promised to act as the kinsman redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. But there is one male relative closer than Boaz who has first rights to redeem the land and the widows. Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me, so that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and to Malin. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malin, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah, 
and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me as we continue now with our prayer of confession, also printed in your bulletin. Almighty God, you made us in your image, and we belong to you. You have redeemed us in Christ and we owe you our thanks and our allegiance. But we fail to give thanks to you as we should, and we are often motivated by our selfish desires. We admit we have broken your commandments by what we have done and failed to do. Have mercy on us, Lord. Forgive us for our sins and train our hearts to follow after Christ our Lord and our Savior, through whom we pray. Amen. Let us now keep a moment of silence and offer to God our individual prayers of confession. Friends, Colossians 1.13 reminds us that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel. Through faith in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. <laughs> be seated. And I invite you to turn to the back of the bulletin and to join me as we read together our new vision creed. And if you would join me, we will read this in unison, our vision creed. We believe that God calls us to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ, to encourage all to grow as disciples through worship, growth groups, and service, to form spiritual relationships that are vital to our growth as disciples, 
to reach out to others with a focus on families and our local community by God's grace and the help of the Holy Spirit. We will glorify God in all things and work to see his kingdom grow. Thank you. And will the children please come down and join me on the front pew. I love spending time with you guys, and I'm always so glad when you come down front with me. Let's see what I've got here. Something to show you today. What do I have? I've got some things in my wallet here, in my pocket. I've got, what do I have here in my hand, do you think? Okay. Let's see what all I've got here. I've got, I've got, uh, what's on that? $20 bill, okay. What's, uh, what's that one? Okay. What's uh, that one? Five. Okay, and one. how much do I have? Whoa! <laughs> I am pretty impressed. <laughs> okay, okay, smarties. Uh, who's on that one dollar bill? George Washington, very good. Who is on Abraham Lincoln? Okay, right. Uh, okay. And, okay, this is a tough one. I don't know. <laughs> 20. Jackson. Jackson, that's right. That's right. Who are those guys? Presidents. They're presidents. Why do we have faces of presidents on our money and not things like maybe the king of England. Okay. Okay, they need to be remembered. Well, we could remember the king of England too. Why isn't he on here? These are U.S. presidents and this is U.S. money, right? This is U.S. money. So, so uh, the image of the presidents are reminding us that this is U.S. presidents reminds us this is U.S. money. Now, there's another image I want to talk to you about, and the Bible talks about it, and it is on and in every one of you. The Bible says that we are made in the image of God. Did you know that? God, God made us. God made every human being so that we are a little bit like God. You know, that is a very good question. God made all the living creatures, but he made human beings to be very special because he didn't make the plants, he didn't make the dogs, he didn't make the horses in the image of God. But it says he made people in the image of God so that we would be like him. Now, we're not all powerful. We're not eternal. But we are able to love, aren't we? That's because God is love. We are able to create things, make things. You guys are so good at making things. I, I see it in our class. You... So we are, we are able to create because we're made in the image of God. Um, we are able to care about other people. We're able to think because God is, is a thinking God and, and he gave us minds so that we can think. So we are made in the image of God. And that reminds us, when we think about how God made us and we are in his image, it reminds us we belong to God. This money is U.S. money, and we can use it, but we belong to God. We are made in his image. So no matter how we use money, no matter what country we're a part of, no matter uh, how old we are, young we are, we are made in the image of God, and we belong to God. 
Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you. I thank you that you made us and that you made us. Uh, we're, we're all different, and yet you've made us all in your image. So help us, Lord, to live up to that image in the ways we love people and care people, the things we think about, the things that we do and make. Help us to live up to that image of God because we belong to you. And thank you, Lord, that you have made us a part of your family and that we know we will belong to you not just for a little while but forever. And, Lord, I thank you for these children whom you have made in your image. I thank you for the, for the gifts that you have given to them, for the things that you have uh, uh, put in them that make them unique and special. And I pray that you would watch over them as they grow and help us all, Lord, to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. They're going to lead us in a hymn, Take My Life and Be Consecrated. That is a hymn in our hymnal. However, the words that the band will be singing are a little bit different. So uh, if you want to read the hymnal for the harmonies, that's good. If you start hearing something different, look at the words that are up here on the screen, and we'll all be singing out of the same hymnal. Good. Thank you. Please stand. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. At the impulse of thy love Take my feet and let them be Swift and beautiful for thee Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Always only for my King Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my moments and my days, let them flow with ceaseless praise, let them flow with ceaseless praise. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. Take 
take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. You may be seated. Thank you, band. I appreciate that. Um, I, I am very grateful for the ways we do a, a blended kind of worship service. We do new stuff. We do old stuff. We do traditional uh, hymns. We we do uh, some of the newer hymns and music. Um, what a, what a fascinating way we happen to do it. it is, this morning our choir sang the contemporary thing and the band played uh, an old hymn in a very fresh way. I just, I just love that. Well, when I was talking with the, the choir a little bit, chatting with them before worship, Beth, Beth asked me, are you really going to preach on death and taxes? <laughs> and I said, yes, I surely am. Um, and Sean quipped, he said, then we should sing, Jesus paid it all. <laughs> well, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. We've been going through the Gospel of Mark, and this is where we come this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would make our hearts your throne, that you would enable us to sit together under your word, and that we would not only receive this word as coming from you and your voice, but that you would use your word and your spirit to help us hear and to respond, that you would so fill and mold our hearts that they would become your throne, that we would, we would be transformed knowing that we belong to you, that we would be changed and made different because you are our God and we are yours. You have redeemed us by the blood of Christ. And so, Lord, in this moment, when we, when we open your word together, would you do a mighty and holy work in our lives so that we might hear you and respond to you in faith and obedience and bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus we pray, amen. So our text for this morning, we come to Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 27. Hear the word of God. And they sent to him, that they is probably the, the Jewish leaders, it's probably the Sanhedrin that is managing things here, the kind of the Jewish uh, high governing body, the, their highest court, and they've been sending people to Jesus in a series of, of uh, seven different confrontations recorded in the Gospel of Mark. And they're all trying to, to trip Jesus up in some way to diminish his authority. And remember, these are all Holy Week events. This is all happening just in the days before his trial and death and crucifixion and resurrection. So that, that they're, they're, they're building a case against Jesus. That's what's going on here. Uh, they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? 
But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, he left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third, likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife shall she be? Will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Benjamin Franklin popularized the expression, in this world nothing is certain except death and taxes. Humorous, poignant, a little overstated for effect. He wrote that in a letter, ironically, just five months before he died. Death is certain. And taxes seem almost as unavoidable. Is nothing else certain? Well, yes, of course. God is certain. God created us, loves us, saves us by grace and through faith in Christ. That's certain. Jesus said he has gone to prepare a place for us in the Father's house with many rooms. That's certain. What does our faith, our certain faith in our certain God tell us about other certain things like death and taxes. Jesus is asked about these things in his passage. Yes, I'm going to talk about death and taxes because Jesus does. And I could bring these two topics, these two episodes together in this way. This is how I'm going to put it together, kind of my, my main idea and broad outline for this morning, that God is our ultimate allegiance in this life, and he is our hope in the life to come. We meet all obligations that we have in light of God's claim upon us, that's paramount. And we face death in the hope of God's power to grant us life everlasting. So let's see how this works out in these two particular cases mentioned in Mark's gospel. 
First, we owe God our ultimate allegiance. We belong to Him. But that does not eliminate other obligations, other responsibilities, lesser ones, but still pressing ones in other areas of life, like taxes, like government. Now, church and state issues are, are hotly discussed today, and really they have been just about throughout all of history of church and state. That goes back a long, long way, and the religious leaders of Jesus' day confronted him on the issue of taxes. Uh, they came to him with excessive flattery, didn't they? Teacher, we know you are true. You truly teach the way of God. You are not swayed by anyone's opinion. Now, if people come to you with that kind of smarmy buildup, you better watch out. They're not there to learn. This is a gotcha interview. Let's get him to say something we can use against him. Even so, the question is a good one. And it was on the minds of the people Nobody likes paying taxes. I, I, I take that back. Actually, there was a guy uh, what was a member of this church years ago. He's with the Lord now, but he liked paying taxes. Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he, he was from um, another country that, where the taxes were much higher, and he just thought we got a lot of bang for the buck. He felt pretty good about that. I never shared that opinion, but that, that was his idea. Back in Jesus' day, it was galling to pay taxes. Why? Because those taxes went to the Roman government that had conquered them and oppressed them. Their country... The land that God had promised them was being ruled from Rome. And there were Roman soldiers roaming the streets enforcing the Roman law. So it is a loaded question, isn't it? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Is it something we should do? There's a big movement going on trying to figure out some way of rebelling and getting rid of the Romans. Why should we be paying for their soldiers? And we can't help but admire the wisdom of Jesus. He knows what's coming, right? He sees this from a mile away. Why put me to the test? He's on to them for sure. Point one for Jesus. And then he says, bring me a denarius. That's a coin. Worth about a, a day's wage for a common laborer. Maybe the equivalent of, say, like, like a, a hundred dollar bill. The face on the denarius was that of Tiberius Caesar with the inscription, Tiberius Kaiser Dewey Augusta Filius Augustus. Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. Now to the Jew, that coin was blasphemous. Caesar is not God. They were forced not only to pay taxes to the Roman occupiers, but to do so using this heretical coin. So Jesus asks, get this, Jesus asks, he says, do any of you good, upright Jewish leaders happen to have one of those blasphemous coins on you? Well, yeah, I've got... Oh, uh, I, somebody just gave me this. Point two for Jesus. 
And the Lord asks, whose likeness and inscription is this? Caesar's. And Jesus, who is more quotable than Ben Franklin, says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. Jesus isn't siding with the zealots who are plotting rebellion. Christians are to pay taxes. God calls us to be good citizens and to respect governing authorities. Even if they are good, even if they claim to be God, whoa. Are there limits to that? Absolutely. There are. There have to be, right? Because Caesar is a lesser authority. God is the ultimate authority, and there's no one higher than God. So we should obey the government unless our duty to God prohibits us. Uh, Jesus is laying that out here, and, and we see it established other places in Scripture, probably most notably in the Bible, the book of uh, Romans, chapter 13, just a few verses, he says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So the Bible will say a few verses later, then pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. But Jesus is saying, remember this, God is first, and you owe him everything. So Jesus doesn't stop here. Render to God what is God. Render to Caesar what's Caesar's, but render to God what is God's. The coin is made in the image of Caesar. It is his, his. You and I, on the other hand, are made in the image of God. Your taxes belong to the government. You and everything that you are, everything that belongs to you, that belongs to God. And that is true for every human being, not just Christians. You may not acknowledge your Creator, but you still owe Him everything. Render yourself to God. Next up are the Sadducees and the question of death and eternal life. And here we learn that we have the hope of resurrection because of the power of God. The religious leaders, the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day were, were divided into several different groups. Uh, they all had uh, kind of different ideas about um, about interpretations of scripture or the way we should live it out in society. They were a little bit like political parties, um, only they had more uh, spiritual influence uh, as well as social authority. The Sadducees, one of the things that made the Sadducees different from, say, the Pharisees, the other biggest group, um, they, they believed in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the books of Moses, the law of Moses. They believed in those five books, but they did not believe the others were authoritative. The prophets, the wisdom literature, the Psalms, all that kind of stuff. They, they, they did not, that was not part of their, their Bible. And they did not believe in supernatural things, and they didn't believe in the resurrection. Most Jews did. Most Jews did by the time uh, of Jesus, um, but the Sadducees did not. And you will never forget that if you remember this one quip. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, and that's why they're so sad, you see. <laughs> now, when you want to know the difference between the, uh, the debates between the Pharisees over the Sadducees, this was the big issue. Which one was which, you'll, you'll never forget it now. 
and they confront Jesus with a case study. And the kind of reasoning they use here is called reductio ad absurdum. I've just quoted Latin twice in one sermon. I've never done that before. Okay, I'll never do it again. Uh, we, we don't know the name, but we know this form of reasoning. We do it all the time, reducing something to its absurd level. To say, okay, you've got this idea, you've got this proposition, but if that's true, then this thing must occur or happen or be true, and this thing can't be true. So your premise, we, we have to reject. What you say can't be true because it leads to an absurd, impossible situation. And here's the particular case. A woman's husband dies, and there are no offspring. She marries his brother who dies, and so on through seven brothers. Whose wife will she be in heaven? The argument is life after death cannot be real because it would create these kinds of impossible situations. So they say. And it's true, the Bible encouraged a childless widow to marry her dead husband's brother to preserve the family name and inheritance. Uh, and I, 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 I'm not going to go any further than that, and I don't need to. I was so grateful. Jude, Judy mentioned before church, she said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of this leveret marriage, it's called, in the Bible. Is, is that okay? And I said, is it okay? That's awesome, because I don't have time to unpack that. So she did a, a, a good explanation of that, and we'll work through that some Wednesday night, too. But even apart from that particular arrangement of the law, even if the husbands weren't brothers, we might well wonder, right, if a person has been married more than once, what will those relationships be like in heaven? You ever wonder that? Jesus gives an answer. It's not an easy one. He tells the Sadducees quite bluntly that they are quite wrong. In this long-standing debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he sides clearly and definitively with the Pharisees in this matter. He's not waffling. He's not saying, well, you've got some good points, and they've got some good points. And, uh, there's, there's probably some compromise, something in there. No, no you, are, you are quite wrong. Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now, this is troubling to many Christians, especially to those who are happily married. But I remember worrying about this even as a kid. The love between a husband and wife is so precious, it's hard to imagine heaven being heavenly without that. And people will have all kinds of things, too. They'll think, well, well if heaven is heaven and all, then it's got to have this thing. Not just marriage, but, you know, well, dogs must go to heaven. I love my dog. It wouldn't be heaven without my dog. Or chocolate. Okay, we're getting silly here. Oh. <laughs> but you get the idea. We, we start to put in this idea that heaven must be like everything that I imagine it to be. And if it's not, then, you know, I, it, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Here's what I believe about heaven. The Bible says that Jesus is the way to life everlasting, that those who die in the faith will be raised to be with God, in whose presence there is fullness of joy and no sorrow whatsoever forever. Now, how does that work out in every detail? 
I don't know. But if there is anything that we enjoy here on earth that is not in heaven, we won't miss it at all because it will be replaced by something better. Every earthly blessing will either be retained or surpassed in the life to come. And some of the blessings that we enjoy so much now are only a taste. It's like an entree. The things that we enjoy about them are all going to be manifested in their perfect form in some way in heaven. Heaven, uh, one writer put it this way, it's always stuck with me, that heaven is not about, it is, is always about addition and never subtraction. In the case of marriage, for example, Ephesians 5 tells us that the union of a husband and wife are intended, among other things, but intended to point to the union of Christ and his believers, Christ and the church. Christians are the bride of Christ, and Jesus is the bridegroom. And we will enjoy relationships with one another and with Christ as never before. Now, I'll resist going further, but I want to reassure you that if Jesus is saying we won't be married in heaven, what we have will be even better. We won't be sorrow, sorrowful. We will understand and we will rejoice in it. But Jesus is, in this interaction here with the Sadducees, he is pointing out that we will be wrong, quite wrong, about a lot of things if we don't know Scripture or the power of God. If we are going to live wisely and faithfully, we need to know God's Word and trust God's power to do things beyond our imagining. The Sadducees were likely offended that Jesus said, I mean, these, these, are, the, these are the professors of religion, right? And they're being told, uh, you, you don't know Scripture. Have you ever read in the Bible the burning bush thing? Duh. But you know, they rejected a lot of the Bible. Even as today, people reject parts of the Bible. They may not cut them out of their Bibles and just say that, that I, don't, I don't want to deal with that. And we will be wrong about a lot of things if we ignore scripture. Jesus quotes the part of the Bible they did believe in. God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And those patriarchs did not cease to be when they died. They are still alive in God. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And Jesus also reminds them and us of the power of God. They were not wrong about marriage and the resurrection. I'm sorry, they were wrong about marriage and the resurrection because they couldn't see beyond their own reason. Their God was too small. Their view of his might was blurry. And ours might be too. God can heal our bodies and bring peace where there is war, revitalize inflationary economies and aging congregations. God can do all of those things. Do not disbelieve the power of God. What will he do? That we don't always know. But what God has pledged to do is accomplish his purposes, which are good and glorious. And we will be raised with Christ in the last day to life everlasting. If we do not know the power of God, we will be wrong and scared about a lot of things. Taxes are certain. You have about 38 hours left to get yours in. <laughs> but in all responsibilities, in all of our duties, we remember it's God first. We owe our ultimate allegiance always and forever to Him. Death is certain. I don't know how much time we have, but we will die. The Bible says 
It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. I'll, I'll wait on the other cross-reference from John 5. I'll share it on Friday. But, but, but Jesus says, you know, the other thing is, resurrection is certain too. And we will all be raised. But Jesus says some will be raised to life and some will be raised to judgment. So resurrection is certain. What may not be certain is which resurrection we're going to. But the gospel is given to us so that we might know that Christ is our Redeemer, that He has paid for our sins, that He goes to prepare a place for us. When Mary and Martha grieved for their dead brother Lazarus, they did not mourn like Sadducees. Martha told Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And he said, Martha, do you believe this? And she said, yes. Do you believe this? Taxes are certain. Death is certain. And scripture is certain. The power of God is certain. He raised Jesus. And he will raise all who believe in him to be with him. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, You display your wisdom in so many ways. In your word, we, we marvel at the wisdom of Jesus at dealing with these pressing and thorny matters. Teach us, Lord, to honor those that you have placed in authority, but to remember always that we are made in your image and that we belong to you. Teach us to know your word to be good students of your word, to apply it to our lives. Teach us to trust your power in all things, even death, so that we will not be misguided or afraid. And thank you for leading us in this life and for the hope of life everlasting. Lord Jesus, it is because we are confident in your word and confident in your power that we come before you. And we worship you and we lift up our prayers to you. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bring healing to Betty Dowdle. We give you thanks that you have been restoring Tom through his recovery. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bring healing mercies to, to Lynette and Kathleen and Christina and Pastor Ed. Lord, bring the peace, the, the comfort of your Holy Spirit and the hope of resurrection to the family and friends of Lee Hayhurst and to all those who grieve and mourn. For those who are suffering, Lord, would you, or are burdened, would you show mercy? For those who are facing difficult trials or decisions or feeling fear or despair, bring hope. And Lord, wherever there is enmity or brokenness or violence or discord, especially in hot spots like the, in the Middle East that where things seem to be escalating, Lord, would you please send peace. Yes. And Lord, we believe your word. We believe in your power. We know that you can do these things. And so it is with confidence and faith that we place them in your hands even as we pray together as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will certainly do it. Amen. Amen.